morning, everybody. Hey, if you feel comfortable, why don't you stand and join us as we sing this morning? These are the days that we pray for. The best is not yet come Cause Jesus, you're not done with me You're doing a new thing You're doing a new thing And I see a wave of revival Psalm 100, one to five says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all the generations. 
I love passages like that, that just implore us to praise the Lord. And I think it's so cool that that one in particular doesn't say, praise the Lord, oh, you individual. It says, praise the Lord, all the earth, all the earth, earth, praise his name. And I think that's so cool because it really shows that worship of God, it isn't circumstantial. Any person at any time in all of the earth could praise the Lord and it would be so, so fitting. And it's interesting, you know, I just planned a wedding a few weeks ago and we were getting so excited about our guest list. We had all these people that we just love. We're like, oh, they're gonna be together in one room. And then suddenly I realized all of these people are gonna be together in one room. I'm like these people find this kind of thing fun, these people don't. These people are older, these people are younger, these people like these people, but not these people. And suddenly I'm like, oh my gosh, it's impossible to plan an event that would be just so for all these people, that would be fitting for every single person in that room. But then we gather together on Sundays and every single Sunday, no matter who is in this room, at what time, it is always fitting for every person here to worship the Lord. You know, whether you're going through something amazing right now, it's fitting for you to praise God because he's a good father who gives good gifts. And maybe you're going through something really trying, really challenging, really difficult right now. Well, it's actually still fitting for you to worship God because he promises that no matter what, he's in control. You can worship him, you can trust him. He's good, he's with you, he's for you. Or maybe you're just in a place where you're like, I'm neither, I'm just kind of gray, I'm just kind of numb. Well, it's still fitting for you to praise the Lord. One of the songs that we sing is, come on my soul, don't you get shy on me. Sometimes we need to wake ourselves up and just remember God is so good. You're completely forgiven, you're completely redeemed, you're reconciled to God. And so we're gonna sing a new song together and it's called Reign Above It All. And it talks about the truth that God does reign above all things in the world and all things in your world. And so as we sing this together, why don't we just lift him up over our situations, whatever we're going through, good or bad, and let him just reign above and find peace in that together today.
these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered mended and whole empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free oh amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me oh I once was lost but now I am found was blind but now I see oh I can see
Good morning, everyone, and welcome here to church. It's been so moving going through this series together, and I just want to say that I'm proud of you for being a part of church today. Whether you're watching online or in person, live or later this week, I know that God is here and that he has a message of hope for you specifically, wherever you might find yourself today. I also want to take a second to welcome everyone that is new to Southside, or maybe today is even your very first time here. We hope that you've been having an impactful morning so far and feel right at home. If you are new or newish today, we would also love it if you text the word hello to our phone number, which is 604-670-3040. You'll get a link sent to your phone, which is our digital connections card, and you'll also get a $5 Starbucks e-card emailed to you on us as a way for us to just say thank you for being with us today. So it's officially summer, and we've prepared to make this year our best summer yet on Sundays as well as throughout the week. And there's something for everyone this summer, Southside Kids, Youth, young adults, and yes, some of us grown-ups too. In fact, there's too much happening to go over it all, so please make sure to text NEWS to our phone number, 604-670-3040, to see everything planned for summer at Southside. You'll find everything from adult drop-in barbecues and youth summer parties to our next Baptism Sunday and our Summer for This City service day. No matter how long you've been coming to Southside, there is something for everyone, and you're all very much invited. So text in NEWS again, get that link, and start signing up for our best summer yet. In a few moments, we're going to have our regular time where we come together and give in order to fund the mission and vision of this church to see our city change through Jesus, one life, one story at a time. But first, I wanted to share something with you. I'm sure a lot of you have kept an eye on your bank account or investments lately, and I'm no different. And one of the things that blew me away was how much money was in our children's registered educational savings plan. Now, that's not a brag, but it highlights a principle that I want to share with you this morning. And that's automating the important. Now, my wife, Becky, and I want to steward what God has blessed us with and help our kids achieve their goals and dreams. So before they were born, we set up an RESP and decided to automate giving to it every month. And it's grown substantially. Now, if it was up to me to contribute every month to our RESP, uh, there'd probably be a regular balance of like $224.13. 
but I think it's important to automate the things we value that are important to us. I know our family actually values the work that God is doing through His church, Southside, all throughout the year, so much more than just saving for school. And that's why we automate our giving too. And I'd invite you to consider automating your giving so that we can continue to be generous and sow seeds in our community, even through the weeks where we might be at the beach or around a campfire. And we can't wait to see how God will multiply our generosity and make a kingdom impact as we prepare to give together today. To join us in changing our city and the world, simply text the word GIVE to 604-670-3040, and you'll be able to find all the ways that you can join us and give today, as well as automated giving information as well. Okay, everyone, time to get ready for week four of our 12-step series together. The first three weeks have been challenging and compelling, and I can't wait to hear the word God has for us through Pastor Mike again today. Now, last week, I extended a personal challenge to commit to staying engaged in our seats in these messages and trying to stay in this room because we believe that God has a word for us. And then the lights came on and a bunch of people ran out of the room. Now I was a linebacker for 18 years, so please don't make me chase you into the lobby and drag you back to your seat. Now, I'm obviously totally kidding, or, or am I? Now, some of you might be scared, and please don't be scared, because I am just kidding, but other people might be thinking, this church is amazing. But no, really, I am kidding. I'm not gonna drag you back to your seat. But we are serious in that we believe that God actually has an amazing word for us and a work for us through these 12 weeks. Now let's not hide from that. Let's stay connected and engaged in these messages. And I love you guys. Enjoy the rest of the service. So in October of 2020, my wife, Corinne, and I spent a week in Kelowna. Some friends have a house right on the lake. And so when they offered, we said yes. I don't know if you remember this. You probably don't. But 2020 was a little bit stressful. And so when we got to the end of 2020, we were very much looking forward to a week of R&R. So on the day that we were going to leave, I had a few things that I needed to do here at the church. And... I remember thinking to myself, man, if I get a minute, I want to download an audiobook for Corinne and I to listen to for the three and a half hour drive to Kelowna. But here's the thing, I never got a minute. Like one thing led to another, led to another, led to another, and then it was time to load up the car and head to Kelowna. Well, about half an hour into the drive, I came to wish greatly, very greatly, that I had downloaded that audiobook. Because a half an hour into our three and a half hour drive to Kelowna, my wife Corinne looked at me and she said, I resent you. And thus began our three and a half hour drive to Kelowna. Now, it should be noted that she wasn't angry, she wasn't raging, she wasn't out of control at all. In fact, she had been doing some work in her life, and out of that, in a kind way, she said, I resent you. But why? Why? Well, to understand why, I think you got to understand Mike Manis throughout our marriage. So let's start on the positive. On the positive side, I'm a really hard worker. You're never going to hear anybody criticize anybody for being a hard worker, and that's true. It's a great thing to work hard. I think there's something absolutely sacred about a man or a woman rolling up their sleeves and working hard to provide for their family. I think it's a beautiful thing. Hard work is great, and I'm a hard worker. But that probably doesn't fully encapsulate it. So let's just take it a step further. I'm probably what you could call driven. Driven by what? Driven by an overwhelming need and desire to succeed, achieve, accomplish, and win. Driven by an overwhelming need or desire to succeed, achieve, accomplish, or win. But even driven doesn't really do it justice. So let's take it one step further. At times... I've been compulsive, 12, 14, 15 hour days. It's funny too, because if we go back 15 or 20 years and you sat me down and you said, hey Mike, here's the thing. You're a human being, not a human doing. You are a human being, not a human doing. I would have said, wow, that's awesome. That is so true, fist bump, thank you for that. And if you would have gone further and said, Mike, just remember, As a human being, you have to know this, that 
There is nothing that you could ever do to make you more loved, more acceptable, more matter than Jesus has already done. It's not about your work, Mike. It's about the work that Jesus did when he died and rose again. I would have looked at you and said, that's so beautiful. That's amazing and absolutely true. I could not agree more. And if you further would have said, and Mike, just one more thing, as a human being and not a human doing, just remember this, you are not working for victory in this world. You are working from victory. I would have high-fived you and said, man, that is great. I am there. I absolutely knew it right up here. Right up here. I mentally knew that I'm a human being and not a human doing. There's nothing that I need to do. There's no work that I have to achieve to be more loved, more valuable, more worthy, more accepted than I am right now. I had it up here, but I didn't have it here. 18 inches could have been a million miles for me. Sometimes 18 inches can be like a million miles to get the truth from here down to here. See, because down here, here's how I lived at times. I'm worthy if I win. I'm somebody if I succeed. That's it. So in some ways, because I couldn't bridge that 18-inch gap between head and heart, I was powerless over my proclivity to work compulsively. Now, I use that word powerless on purpose because we're in this 12-week series based on the 12 steps of Recovery. And the first step of the 12 steps says this. My life is unmanageable and I'm powerless to fix it. That some aspect at least of my life is unmanageable. In other words, I can't, in some area of my life, I can't bridge the gap between my head and my heart. 18 inches might, might as well be a million miles. My life is unmanageable and I'm powerless to fix it. Step one. The 12 steps originated way back in the 1930s with the formation of an organization called Alcoholics Anonymous. And in the big book, you'll find the 12 steps. It's changed hundreds of millions of lives. But I've been thinking a lot lately. Remember how I said, you probably don't remember, but 2020 was hard. See, here's the thing I think you do remember. I think that 2020 was hard. I think these last few years have been hard. In fact, I would say that they've hurt. And so what I think is in this 12-week series, what I want to do is I want to get really serious about healing. I want to take some conscious, intentional steps towards healing because healed people bring healing. See, I, I think it's time for us all to do a little bit of recovery. And I know some of you might be watching online or in person right now and you're saying, well, here's the thing, Mike, I'm not a wingnut like you, okay? So I, my life is not unmanageable and I am not powerless. I'm powerful. It's smooth seas and clear sailing for me. I am so absolutely glad that you are here because God has a plan for compulsively arrogant people as well, okay? <laughs> so we're, we're driving to Kelowna. So why do you resent me? Huh. So for those of you who don't know, Corinne and I have four biological kids and then our youngest two uh, sons are adopted from 80. So we're a family of eight. So what does it look like when you're a hard worker as a part of a family of eight? Well, it's a great thing. I said that earlier, right? It's great. I, I was able to, throughout our, uh, as our family grew, to provide for our family. Even though most of my adult life has been spent in Christian uh, ministry of some kind, doesn't pay exceptionally well, I was always able to supplement. I had an almost um, limitless ability to continue to work harder and harder and harder, so bring in different streams of income so I could provide. That's a good thing. So what does it look like when you have a family of eight and you're driven? When you're, when you're driven and you have a family of eight? Well, I think in a way that's a good thing also. Because I wasn't just driven to succeed at work, I was also driven to succeed at home. What I mean by that is if you talk to, talk to Corinne, you talk to my kids, I think I was a pretty fun dad. Like when I got home, I was on. I wasn't sleepy, I was, I was on, and I wanted to succeed at home. And so uh, we worked hard and we played hard and we had a lot of moments. So what does it look like when you're compulsive as a part of a family of eight? That's where it gets a little bit tougher, right? Because if you're working 12, 14, 15 hours a day and you sleep a little bit, you start to run out of hours. You get it? And I said this earlier that you're not a human doing, you're a human being. 
Relationships are largely built in the moments between the moments. Relationships are largely built in the margins. In the margins between the big moments. Do you get what I mean? And I miss some of those. I miss some moments too. As I was preparing to speak to you today, there was one particular moment that came into my mind. Now, Corinne didn't bring it up on the drive to Kelowna, but it just hit me. There was this Saturday in particular. Most teachers didn't work on Saturday. I did, of course. And I was on my way to the school, and Corinne said to me, hey, just one big favor. If you could do this for me, that'd be great. Can you make sure you're back in time for supper? Because Tori, Tori was about nine or ten at this time. Tori has a violin recital tonight. In fact, Tori's been asked to play the national anthem at the beginning of the recital. So Corinne said, could you make sure you're home in time for supper? At that time, it was just the six of us, Tori, Lucas, Emma, Gabe, Corinne, and me. And she said, I'll, I'll have the three kids, and you can take Tori. It can be kind of a daddy-daughter day with Tori. And I said, that's a great idea. Of course I'll be home for supper, it's gonna be awesome. So I get to school and I ran a volleyball practice and then I ran a basketball practice and some of the parents of the players who played basketball for me were upset that their sons weren't getting to play more so they wanted to have a long meeting and so we had a long meeting and then I had to do some marking and then I had to do some prep for the next week and guess what, I forgot about the recital. And I had left my phone at home that day. So now, let's go to Corinne and the four kids at home, Corinne's calling and calling and calling, where is he, where is he, where is he? My phone's sitting in our bedroom, I forgot it. So eventually, she's like, oh, he ain't gonna make it. So she grabs the four kids. Gabe at this time was just in a diaper. So he's sitting in his diaper in the high chair with a bowl of rice. She takes Gabe and his diaper and the bowl of rice, uh, puts them all, everybody into the minivan. They go tearing down Chilliwack Mountain Road because they got to make it to the recital in time. Corinne was hustling so hard that she blew the transmission in our minivan. So about an hour later, I'm driving home down Chilliwack Mountain Road going, man, it's good to be home at about 7 o'clock tonight. This is awesome. And I see our minivan on the side of the road and I think to myself, Oh boy. So we get to West Kelowna at the end of the three and a half hour drive. Corinne had done a lot of talking, I did a lot of listening, and I turned to her and I said, I wholeheartedly support your resentment of me. Which sounds a little bit like a joke when I say it, and I think Corinne even laughed at the time, but I meant it. And, and, and it actually began a really, really fascinating week in my life. So we were there for a week in October of 2020. The weather was absolutely beautiful for October, but no one else was on the lake. And I spent hours every day for a week, hours, on a paddleboard out on the lake all by myself. And I spent all this time saying, where am I? How did I get here? And where am I gonna go next? Now I bring all of that up to let you know that we're in week four of this 12-week series, step four. Remember, step one says this, my life is unmanageable and I'm powerless to fix it. Step two says, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Step three says that we made a decision to turn our lives and our will over to the control of God. So in other words, to summarize step one, step two, and step three, I can't, God can, I think I'll let him. Well, once you've taken step three, now you're ready for step four, and this is where the work begins. Step four says this, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Up until October of 2020, I had never done anything like that. I'm a hard worker, I'm driven, I'm, I'm compulsive, I'm looking forward, I'm not looking behind. Like I remember as a young kid once in a while feeling kind of guilty. I remember seeing the minivan parked on the side of Chilliwack Mountain Road, I felt pretty bad, but I never kind of called time out or pushed pause in my life and said, huh, what's going on here? because I'm on to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. And maybe you're a little bit like I am. You're looking and saying, man, I wanna move forward, I don't wanna look back. I wanna suggest to you that the truest way forward will require you to look back a little bit. 
To paraphrase Winston Churchill, I would put it this way. The people who don't learn from their history are doomed to repeat it. That the truest, best way forward for you and for me is to have a look back so that we can move forward. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about a searching moral inventory and a fearless moral inventory. You're going to have to search. You're going to have to search because there's three levels of you. The most superficial level of you is the person that the world sees. The person that the world sees. That's the mask that you wear, the image you portray, the impression that you make on people. And you might find that actually you change a little bit depending on who you're hanging out with. Right? That's why when you were a kid, your parents maybe said to you, man, when, you, when you're dating that person, when you're hanging around with that group, you're just not yourself. And you said, yes, I am. I am myself. I, this is me, the true me. And then you look back later and you thought, ah, that was nothing like me. Okay, so the most superficial version of you is the person that the world sees. The second level of you, still not the deepest. Listen to this. The second level of you, still not the deepest, still not the core of who you are. This is the person you think you are. That's interesting, isn't it? Because I've heard people say before, you can't fool yourself. But you know what? I think we can. I think you and me, I think we're really good at fooling ourselves. And what I was going to say at this point is I was going to say, I mean, some people are delusional, right? They get, they, they get a way more positive impression of how they're doing than they're actually doing. And some people are discouraged. They got a way more negative impression about how they're doing than they're actually doing. But really, really thinking this through and preparing for today, I think we're all both. I think there's days that we're delusional and we think we're doing a little bit better than we are. And then I think there's days and moments that we're pretty discouraged and, we're, and, we, and we think we're doing worse than we actually are. There's a temptation to be delusional in our world, right? There's a temptation to be delusional because we judge ourselves by our intentions and we judge other people by their actions. So when things go horribly wrong, we can always find somebody else to blame. And when things go incredibly right, we can always look at ourselves and go, eh, that was me. Delusion. Delusion is the people that say stuff like this. I know it's really weird. Every teacher I ever had in school is an idiot. None of them like me. It's amazing. Every, every, every boss I've ever had is an idiot. It's just such a coincidence. Every boss I've had is an idiot and they don't like me. Not every person I've married turned out to be an idiot. I don't know what happened. And somebody needs to come alongside that person, put their arm around him and go, I think, I think I might have found a common element in all your idiocy. And it's you, brother. It's you. Okay? So, so, but delusion at times can have us take all the credit and give away all the blame and we can be in delusion. But sometimes the very same day or the next day, we can end up in this place of discouragement where we're incredibly and unfairly hard on ourselves. And I can't do anything right. I always mess up. I have no talent. I have no gifts. I have no ability. I have no chance. Terrible. So the most superficial level of you is the person the world sees, but, 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 the, but the more, the deeper level of you, which is still not you, is actually who you think you are, where we want to get in a searching moral inventory, we want to get to the me that I really am. Paul said it this way in Galatians 6, make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you've been given, and then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. Okay? So, so beyond the person the world sees, beyond discouragement, beyond delusion, there's me. And I got to search. I want to give you four S's that are going to help you search. Four S's that will help you search. Here's the first S. Strengths. For some of you, this will be the most difficult. You're pretty awesome. You're pretty gifted. You're pretty talented. So talk about that. Got me thinking, you know, I think as we do this searching moral inventory, we're going to need a little bit of help. Because if you're in a discouraged state of mind right now, you're not even going to be able to come up with any strengths. 
So you need a counselor to walk you through this. You need a small group leader. Maybe sit down with your spouse and walk through this. Somebody that can give you a sober second opinion. Go, wait a minute. You do have strengths. You do have talents. You do have ability. You have a unique thing to offer to our world. So the first S is strength. Take a look at your strengths. The second S is this, scars. Scars. I'm not going to ask you if you've been hurt. We've all been hurt. So who hurt you? How did they hurt you? And what kind of scars did it leave on your life and on your character? Now, I'm not doing this so that you can relive those horrible moments. Just the opposite, in fact. But sometimes you've got to look backwards so that you can move forward. So who hurt you? How'd they hurt you? What kind of marks has it left on your character and on your life? And do you resent them? Do you resent them? Do you resent them? Let me talk to you for a second about resentment. The word resentment comes from two root words. Re means again. Sent comes from the same root word as sense or sentiment. It means feel. Resent means again feel. Feel again. Feel again. Feel again. When you've been hurt and you hold on to resentment, you feel that hurt over and over and over again. That, that, that your anxiety, your blood pressure, your emotions, they can't tell the difference between you reliving it and when it happened the first time. You relive it over and over and over again. That's why, by the way, psychologists will tell you that the one common element in all fatally addicted people is a proclivity towards resentment. Look, imagine that, 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 that when you resent, you feel again, you feel again, you feel again, and your body keeps the score. Your body doesn't know the difference. And now imagine you're carrying a whole armload full of those resentments around with you. No one can bear that weight. So before we leave this topic of scars, I want to say this. You want to move forward? You got to let that go. Have you let that go? Because you got to let it go. I think sometimes when, we, when we're holding desperately on to resentment, we're thinking to ourselves, I'm going to keep that person prisoner. I'm going to keep that person who hurt me prisoner. And then one day, we finally decide to let it go, to set the prisoner free, and guess what we find out? The prisoner that I just set free was me. So who's hurt you? How have they hurt you? And have you? Let go. So we want to get to the person that I am beyond what the world sees, beyond, be, beyond delusion, beyond disappointment. We want to go further. So we want to talk about our strengths, our scars, and then our shame. So you've been hurt. Have you hurt other people? Things that you said or did that you shouldn't have said or did. Things that you should have done that you didn't do. Do you have guilt? Are you walking around under this heavy burden of baggage from your past? See, because one of the things that we're going to need to do in this 12 steps, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it later, we're going to have to let that go too. But how has your guilt shaped you? And the last S is secrets. Secrets. So now I want you to go back and I want you to start again. Start with strengths. Are there strengths that you think that you might have, but you're actually ashamed to say them out loud? It's almost like a dream that you have, that you might have that ability, you might have that strength, but you never want to step out. You never want to admit, hey, I think I could do this. Secrets. Well, what about scars? So you went through and you did your hurts, right? Okay, but is there a hurt or two that you have so far back that you just don't 
want to relive it. I don't want you to have to relive it either. But the truth is, if we're going to move forward, we have to take a moment and take an honest look back. And then what about shame? Is there guilt that you have that when we went through shame earlier, you kind of blew past that because you just don't want to go there. But the truth is, you just have to in order to move forward. And addictions counselors will tell you that when it comes to the secret shame and the secret scars, often they're found around the area of sexuality. So it's a searching moral inventory, getting past the person that the world sees, getting past delusion, getting past discouragement, and finding me. But it's really weird in the wording of this step. We made a fearless moral inventory. I don't get how this is supposed to be fearless, to be completely honest with you. Like on some levels, don't you look at this and go, are you kidding me? I'm supposed to be fearless about this? Like I'm supposed to go through all of the scars, all of the hurts, all of the things that happened to me that can never be undone. Hmm, that's fun. And then all of the guilt that I have all of the shame that I have, all of the baggage that I'm carrying around. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun either. And not only that, but talking about my strengths, well, now i got to look back and realize that some of those scars and some of that shame have made it so that I didn't manifest the strengths in my life nearly to the degree that I should have. And that doesn't sound sound fun, and it doesn't sound sound like something that I would approach fearlessly. It got me thinking about a passage out of the Old Testament. There's this prophet named Jeremiah, and he writes to his people, the Israelites, and there are people who have a lot of strengths, but they also have a lot of shame and a lot of scars and a lot of secrets. And they're in bondage. And he writes this in Lamentations chapter 3. He says this, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh every morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in him. They say this, the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. I heard someone say this week, the truth will set you free, but not until it's done with you. This is a big deal. This is hard. I make a searching moral inventory of my life. This is hard. And the only possible way I can see that I would attack that, that I would approach that fearlessly, is if I knew that there was a God out there whose mercies were actually new every morning. That's it. See, because without that, all the pain and the baggage from my past is like a dark cloud that follows me around. And well, on some level, on some level, I get it. I get it. Hey, if I really want to move forward, I got to take a look back. But here's the dilemma. I don't want to. Because it's so easy to get lost in the pain of my past. Paul says this in Romans 8. With the arrival of Jesus the Messiah, that faithful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation, the spirit of life in Christ. Like a strong wind has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. I'm going to get a little bit theological and philosophical with you right now. So a few weeks ago, Leah was talking about her wedding earlier in the service. A few weeks ago, I, uh, I officiated their wedding. And I said to them, what, what passage, what verses do you want kind of as the centerpiece of your ceremony? And they said, we really want you to pick, Mike. And I kind of felt some pressure, you know? And so I started praying about it. I'm like, God, give me a verse. Please give me a verse. Give me a passage. And he didn't for the longest time. And I'm praying, and I'm like, oh, this thing is coming up. And I don't think I could just stand up there and go, right? So i got to do something. And eventually, God didn't give me a verse. He gave me four words. In the beginning, God. I'm like, that's it? The first four words of the Bible. In the beginning, God. I'm pretty sure it's the only wedding in history 
with the key passages, the first four words of the Bible, in the beginning, God. But I really was thinking about that as I was praying for you and thinking about you, whether you're online or in person right now. In the beginning, God, think. Think. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. God is the unmade maker. God, God is the undesigned designer. God is the uncreated creator. In the beginning, God. There's a Latin term that theologians have been using throughout the ages to describe creation. creation. It's the word ex nihilo. The phrase ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. In the beginning, ex nihilo. In the beginning, out of nothing, God spoke something. In the beginning, God created out of nothing, everything. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And how did God create? He spoke. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let there be galaxies, let there be sun and moon and stars. And God said, let there be oceans and dry land. And God said, let there be mountains and forests and rivers and lakes. And God said, let there be birds in the sky and fish in the sea and animals on the land. And God said, let there be people. God spoke. God's word is a creative force. Ex nihilo. God spoke. Out of nothing, something new. Out of nothing came everything. Ex nihilo. Out of nothing, God spoke. God spoke. God's word is a creative force. You get it? Out of nothing, something new. Out of nothing, God created everything. How? With his word. That's how. Let's fast forward. The fourth book of the New Testament, the Gospel of John. John was one of the disciples of Jesus, and he writes an entire book all about his best friend, Jesus. This is how he opens. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. What did John call Jesus? The Word. The Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God is a creative force. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. In the beginning, God. Ex nihilo. Out of nothing, God spoke. Out of nothing, something new. Out of nothing, God created everything. And Jesus is a human expression of God's Word. I mention all of that because I'm paddling around on Okanagan Lake in October of 2020 all by myself. And there was moments, to be completely honest with you, that I kind of felt like curling up on that paddleboard and crying. Because here's the thing. I can't go back. I can't go back and get Tori to that violin recital. I, I, I can't go back and live in the margins between the moments. You know what I mean? I can't, I, I, I can't go back and be a better teammate for Corinne. I can't go back to when my kids were two years old or four years old or five years old or 16 years old or 17 years old, 17 years old, and I can't. And so part of me just wanted to curl up on that stupid paddleboard and cry. And I got to thinking to myself, what can I do to change the past? What in the world can I do to change the past? What's the answer to that? Logically speaking, logically speaking, what's the answer to that question? What could I ever possibly do to change the past? What's the answer? Nothing. What? Nothing. There's absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing I could do to change the past. Is that right? That's right, right? Nothing. Nothing. Ex nihilo. Ex nihilo. Out of nothing. Out of nothing. Out of nothing that I could do to change the past, enter Jesus. Out of nothing. You hear me? Ex nihilo. Out of nothing. God speaks and sends his son for you and for me. Out of nothing. God speaks. And there's a new thing. Out of nothing. God speaks. 
and creates everything. That's Jesus. His mercies are new every day. Out of nothing, God speaks, and there's a new thing. Out of nothing, God speaks and creates everything. Do you know what I mean? So this is what I do. I hand him my scars, and I hand him my shame, and I hand him my strengths. And when I let go of my resentments, he begins to heal my scars. And when I ask him, he forgives my sins and my strengths, my strengths that I thought were dormant, my strengths that I thought I wasted. This is what he promises in Isaiah chapter 40. You know what Isaiah 40 says? Listen to this. If you wait on the Lord, he'll renew. He'll renew. He'll renew your strength. Out of nothing, out of nothing, he creates everything. So I look back so that I can hand it all to him. And then I move forward knowing that he's the God, he's the God, he's the God, that out of nothing, out of nothing, something new, something new, out of nothing, he'll do everything. Let's pray. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, I wanna start out by just asking you a question. Have you met Jesus? Jesus is the human expression of the word of God. He's powerful. He's doing a new thing. He's a creative force out of nothing. He does everything. He wants to take your scars and your shame and your regrets and your baggage. And he wants to give you a new start, a new beginning. He wants to take your strength and renew it. Out of nothing, he wants to do a new thing. Out of nothing, he wants to do something beautiful. So if you've never invited Jesus Christ into your life, to be your strength and to be your hope and to move you past your past into the life that you were born to live with all heads bowed and all eyes closed. Can you just raise your hand right now because I want to pray for you right in this moment, whether you're online or in person right now, that would be amazing. That's great. (laughs) Nice and high if you don't mind. It's awesome. It's awesome. You can put your hands down. If you just raised your hand, I'm going to pray out loud, and I would just invite you to pray silently along with me. So, Jesus, thank you. When I look back at my past, I come to this logical conclusion. I can do nothing. But I'm reminded today that you can do everything. So today, Jesus, I invite you to be my Savior, that you would forgive my sins, give me a fresh start. As I let go of my resentment, that you would heal my hurts. And today, Jesus, I invite you to be my Lord. Give me the strength to follow you one next step at a time. Today, tomorrow, into the life that I was created to live. A new thing, a beautiful thing, today, tomorrow, and forever. And God, for all of us, for all of us, for all of us who are going to undertake this searching and fearless moral inventory, I pray that we would look back so that we could move forward. That we would be people of truth, yes. But we would also be people who are blessed so that we could be a blessing. That we would be people who are healed so that we could bring healing. That we would be people who know that we're loved so that we could bring love to others. That we would be people who know joy so that we could bring joy to this world that in July of 2022 absolutely needs it. God, we thank you that your mercies are new every day. That you're doing something new. That you're doing something beautiful. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate. Three things. I've been tackled by Dave Poole, and it's not fun, so great job, everybody. I'm just kidding. I've never been tackled by Dave Poole. I wouldn't be here. Okay. Actually, two things. Number one, remember, every week of this series, we're doing our step work. Okay, so you can text the keyword 12 to 604-670-3040, or you can pick up a copy of this week's worksheet on your way out. And finally, I love you guys a lot, and we'll see you next week. Take care.